Okay, when I'm doing shows, the question comes up, you know, from people who are looking at my bowls, well, well how did you carve that thing out like that? And I say, well, I use a lathe, and some people actually don't know what lathes are. Um, if they don't, and I say, well, you take a chunk of wood, you stick it on a motor, it spins around, and while it's spinning, you have all sorts of fancy toys to carve it out with while it spins, and you can tell how much of a tool junkie the person is by if they start drooling or not. But um, easiest way to stick pieces on the lathe is using a chuck. Uh, my preference is a recess. Uh, if you haven't seen this before, I use a Forstner bit on my drill press. Drill the recess. So this bit is just a hair bigger than the jaws on my chuck. So I'll drill in a quarter to three eighths of an inch. I don't want it to go down so deep that the top of the bowl is actually sitting on the jaws of the chuck just enough to hold it. Um, that gives me a very nice mounting point. Put it on, turn the back side, put another recess on the back side, turn the inside. The chuck never comes off the lathe. You don't have to take a faceplate off and on, no screws to mess with. And this is a very secure method for holding it. Uh, for a big bowl like this, this is a fine recess. For smaller bowls, you don't need that much, but generally I'll use this one because I keep my big chuck on the lathe most of the time. If I'm doing a really huge monster piece, then I will use a faceplate. So if you're using a Forstner bit, especially a bigger one on a piece like this to flatten it out or drill a recess, generally it's not much of a safety risk of having the bit catch and start spinning the blank. Uh, this has plenty of mass to it, it's not going to move that much, but do go gently, keep a sharp bit. If you're doing a little bitty piece like this, it doesn't take much for that bit to grab, yank it out of your hands. Um, all sorts of danger problems there. You either have to get something like one of those oil filter like grips on it or put it in a clamp of some sort so you've got a long lever on it just to keep control of it. But just take your time, be careful, keep your bits sharp. Okay, another important part of mounting your bowls on the lathe so they don't come off. You want to have it there secure, you want to make sure it doesn't go flying away and that is the tail stock. Now if you've noticed during most of the filming of this I don't use it. Um, that's primarily old habits. Smaller bowls up to this size or so, it's not really a necessity. Bigger bowls it is primarily because when they come out farther, it's a longer lever, it's farther away from the headstock and it starts vibrating. Um, especially when you're first learning, make sure you use it. It's just in case you do something wrong on the mounting procedures and you're turning at a high speed or doing something unfamiliar. It keeps the bowl in place. Um, this is a great big lathe that has a very big heavy tailstock and it has a very nifty little mechanism here so I can loosen it up, pull it up, lock it in place, and then slide it onto the main bed of the lathe. It just holds things between centers, it's a little more tight, a little more secure. Um, I don't use it most of the time probably should use it more but definitely it helps especially for turning a great big monster bowl like this one yeah. there's no way I could hold that on the lathe and turn it without it vibrating and shaking itself loose without using the tailstock it just makes it way more solid okay now the outside of the bowl is turned it's ready to reverse it remount it in the chuck again so you can turn out the inside if you're using a chuck you've got two main choices you either use a recess or a mortise or you use a tenon or a spigot. Uh, there are arguments that come up on the wood turning forums fairly frequently. You know, which holds better? A lot of people favor a tenon. I favor a recess. As far as either one of them having any advantage over the other, as far as I'm concerned, if they're made properly, they both work very well. It's just a matter of personal taste. For me, a recess, basically I will take it, sand it out on the inside, autograph it, put my finish on it and I'm done with it. If you use a tenon, generally it has to be turned off. It's not as easy to incorporate that into the design. And again, this is just a matter of personal taste. So I'm gonna show you first how to do a recess. Um, so again, basically I've drilled a recess on the front and I'll use the same size recess on the back side so the chuck stays on, I never have to change. How big and how deep and how you make them can vary quite a bit. Um, size matters. So if I'm turning a little bitty bowl like this, 
I'll use a small recess. That's my small chuck. This is more of a plate or platter type form. They generally will work better or look better with a larger recess on it. And if I'm doing a great big monster like this one, I just love it when they work like that. Again, a big recess, and that is plenty of a recess to hold. Keep this bowl on there. Uh, this one was 22 inches in diameter when it came off the lathe. It finished moving at about 25 by 17 inches. Um, the more it warps, the better I like it, but then that's another story. So back to this one. So again, a recess of this size is plenty for turning a bowl this size. It's also plenty for reversing it and coring. I core just about everything and the coring tools can put a little bit extra stress on it. Um, but it's it works just fine. Now if you notice this one, this has a very small shoulder on it. This will work. The thing with using a shoulder that is this delicate is when you tighten your chuck you don't really crank down strong on it. Get it nice and snug but not tight and then when you cut you're not going to be very aggressive. You have to go very dainty with it. But again, this is a little tiny piece. So again, on this bigger piece, that's a lot of meat there. That will hold fine for any type of coring that I want to do. Depth-wise, eighth of an inch to three-sixteenths is fine for most of them. Going more than a quarter of an inch is actually wasting wood. The idea is you want the diameter here to be as close as possible to the diameter of your jaws. So you have just very little expansion inside there. And then when you expand into it, it's got a very good grip. I'm going to make a recess about this size. That's plenty for bowls 14 to maybe 16 inches. Beyond that, it starts getting a little bit iffy. First thing I want to do is mark the diameter. Next thing I do is do my plunge cuts and clean it out. And then it's done. So, okay, this is a compass. It's a dedicated tool. This is super glued into place. If you don't super glue it into place or use some tight lock on it, Use it three, four, five times, and then you'll notice that it's about a quarter inch bigger on the end. So that just keeps it from moving. So what I'll do, turn the lathe on. I'm going to mark narrower than what I have to be and work my way out till this side matches that. Do take care not to touch this side, because if you do, it'll flip over and it turns this thing into a pretzel. Turn the lathe on. That's smaller. Move it out just a hair. That'll be plenty for showing that. Now to cut, I have dovetail jaws. They're about seven degrees, which is a standard dovetail angle for working with hardwoods. They have used dovetails almost forever in woodworking. Basically it is a wedged joint, so you wedge it into place. It gives a way more secure grip than just like a finger joint, which are straight. Um, the dovetail here, this is the way this comes. I'll start inside the line, down about an eighth of an inch or a little more, and then I will come and actually take the line, just a hair over it. Now take the line, clean it out. Final thing to do, right on the very edge here, let it just barely rest and touch the wood. There's always a little bit of a bounce there. That's just from the different going through end grain and going through side grain. This evens it up a little bit so when you reverse it, it'll run more true. I used to think that when I was doing this, when I plunged, I would have to actually plunge sideways. Don't have to, it actually goes in that way all by itself. And the way to make sure that this angle matches the angle on the jaws of the chuck, I will line this up visually with the ways of the lathe. And since this is the same angle as on the chuck, it matches almost perfectly. Notice too, I've got a nice broad shoulder here. This means that when I expand into that, it's not going to break. First step before I reverse it, I want to make sure there are no dust particles, no little clips or shavings down in there. Uh, main reason is any little shaving underneath there gets between the jaws and the wood 
won't make much difference down here, but by the time you get out to the rim of a big bowl, it can make quite a bit of difference. So I've already blown that out, loosen it up, turn it around. And the technique I've developed for seating these, so I don't have to do it on my workbench, so you wiggle it back and forth, and you can kind of feel when it sits square and flat, and tighten it up and see how it spins. The nice thing about the variable speed lays, I can spin it real slow. That one's spinning fairly true. Now when it comes to tightening, I don't want to tighten it as tight as I possibly can. The shoulder I left on that one is good enough that I'm not going to blow it out, but what happens if you have a whole bunch of pressure on it and you have a big nasty catch, if it fails, it's going to fail at the point of most stress, which is going to be where it attaches to the chuck. So I do get it snug in one key on the chuck, move it a little to the other key, get it snug again, get it snug again, get it snug again. And then it's ready for turning the inside. Okay, whenever you're chucking something up, and this doesn't make any difference if you're using a tenon or recess. Grain orientation can play a huge role. It plays a big role if the wood's wet. If the wood's dry, it doesn't do too much. The main thing is grain is running this way. And if you're familiar with wood movement, there's very little movement along the grain or the long grain way, but there's quite a bit around the side just as it dries. And if you're turning a really wet piece of wood and you have two jaws oriented this way, and this way and two jaws this way and this way. This won't compress very much as you're turning but this can compress quite a bit and the idea is if you put your jaws in on the four corners like this then each one's going to be pushing on the same type of grain so if you look at it this way with the jaws this won't give you as secure of a grip as if you turn it 45 degrees like this so the jaws will all be pushing on exactly the same type of wood. With dry wood, since it's already dried and done most of its shrinking and movement, it's not going to make that big of a difference. But if you're turning a wet piece of wood, it can make a pretty big difference. You're turning and all of a sudden you notice that the thing's starting to wobble a little bit. Sometimes tightening up a little bit more helps and sometimes just rotating the chuck about 45 degrees to one side or the other can make a big difference. For mounting a bowl blank, how you mount the jaws of the chuck relative to the grain direction. Doesn't make any difference if you're using a tenon or a recess. Can make a big difference if the wood's wet, a fairly small difference if the wood is dry. But on your end grain or long grain, there's very little compression. On the side grain, there can be a whole bunch, so it'll move a bunch that way. And what you do, rotate the jaws of your chuck about 45 degrees. So then, all the jaws are pushing on the exact same grain direction. If you do it this way, they can work themselves loose, uh, things can come off, you can break your tenon or your recess. Okay, so this is an example of a not very good fit. Main thing that's going on here, big gap right here. What that means is about the only place the metal is actually touching the wood is right there. The difference between the two is if your jaws fit really well, you're grabbing like this, as opposed to this fit where you're grabbing more like this. You just have way more contact on it, a way more secure grip. Okay, so this is a close-up showing you an example of a good tight fit. You notice there's almost no gap right here, very small gap. So you have lots of metal here in contact with the wood. It just gives you a much tighter grip. So how deep do you go for a recess? Generally, I will never go more than about a quarter of an inch. I guess it wouldn't actually hurt if you had the bottom of the bowl resting flat on the jaws of the chuck here. Um, main reason I wouldn't do it is because you're drilling a pretty big recess into the bottom and you're wasting wood and I don't know that it really adds to your support. Quarter inch is generally about all you need even for the biggest bowls. Main thing is it takes a little practice and a little bit of experience to figure out what works best for you. Uh, if you go less than an eighth of an inch, especially if you're turning green wood, sometimes it warps so bad there's no way you can remount it for returning purposes, but um, three sixteenths of an inch to a quarter is plenty. 
Okay, now with making a tenon, it's kind of the same thing as making a recess, except you're grabbing from the outside. Again, size matters. You want the tenon to be big enough so that it's not going to break while you're turning. Generally, you want to figure somewhere around a quarter to a third of the diameter of the bolt. This is about 12 inches. You're going to want your tenon to be about three to four inches across. I seldom measure these exactly. Okay, for making a tenon for this, I want to size it to the jaws of this chuck grabbing on the inside diameter there, so use my dividers again. This is not a dedicated set. And I'll make it a bit bigger. Uh, primary reason is I turn green wood. If this is going to be remounted and turned off again, you can see how this one's gone pretty oval. And you need to make that big enough so if you're going to return the outside and the inside, doing one of the twice turn bowls, you've got enough room so you can turn this down and still be able to grab it in your chuck jaws. Okay, you can see from my divider here that this is a little bit bigger than the chuck jaws, which is just fine. So, turn the lathe on. Again, I'll mark inside a little bit first. Well, got almost perfect that time. I'm going to want to use this as the maximum diameter for my tenon. So what I'm going to have to do is turn some wood away from here down to that edge. I want to turn some of this away so I've got 3 sixteenths of an inch or so of tenon for my chuck to grab onto. Okay, so my favorite roughing tool, scraper again. Okay, now I need to make that shoulder flat. You do not want it curved like this because the chuck will tend to rock and so will the bowl. So come across with the gouge first, make it flat. I still have a little bit of a slope up to that, so I got to take it down a little bit more on the inside. Because if anything, you would want this a little bit concave. One more pass. Now this edge right here needs to be the same angle as my chuck jaws, which means they have to be in at about a seven degree dovetail. You can do that with a skew chisel, you can do that with a gouge, um, you can get specialized tools, you can actually do it with a parting tool. And now I take the skew chisel here, big one, and just put a little tiny dovetail on that. Before I reverse this, another thing I like to do, I like to leave a center mark right there. So when I remount it later to turn off the tenon, it gives me a spot to hook up the tailstock. Just like that, and that'll do. So that's essentially ready for reversing and turning the inside. Now this one doesn't have a dovetail on both sides. Some of them do. You can purchase those, but it'll still work for getting a square edge on there, and then I will make my dovetail. And again, I like to hold it just very, very lightly. Take some of that bounce out of there. You know, until you develop a skill of being able to hold it up to the chuck while the chuck's on the lathe and wiggling it till it's seated properly, and this is more so a problem with bigger blanks, you can put it on your lathe or on the workbench, put the chuck down on it, loosen up till it fits and snug it up that way. And that will get it pretty close to running true. So here's another view of a tenon. You can see there's a little gap here in between the jaws. That's not too bad. That will hold. That's not very risky. And you'll also notice the jaws here are flat on this wood and that the 
tenon does not bottom out in the bottom of the chuck is only down about a quarter of an inch or so. So that's a good secure fit. Okay, now if you notice too, this is a piece of end grain wood. The grain's running this direction. The only time I will never use a recess is if I'm turning something end grain because if you have a recess and it's on the inside, it's going to want to split the wood apart just like chopping firewood. Okay, I have over exaggerated this one just for clarity purposes, but this would be a very bad tenon to leave on a bowl stock. You have a huge area right here. Basically, this shoulder needs to sit on the jaws of the chuck. In this one, the tenon bottoms out on the jaws of the chuck. You do not want that. Basically, it puts your leverage point clear up here. It can break and come off. It's just not a very secure grip. Okay, so this is a little piece of London plane tree. Chainsaw, IA chainsaw. This is a lot rougher than what I normally do, just for demonstration purposes. This is a way bigger face plate than I would use on one like this. It will work. But if you notice, it rocks. It's not flat. Sometimes you can get away with doing your screws on it and tightening them up so it'll work. Or you need to create a flat surface on the top. So I have my center marked. If I was turning this one, I would use this face plate, maybe, still rocks a bit, or I would use this one, which is a little bit smaller, it will hold. Okay, so to make a flat spot for this face plate, again, I'm going to use my drill press and a forstner bit. So first thing, I have my center marked, and I want to scribe a circle on it with a divider or my compass, which is a little bit bigger than the face plate. So mark my center. Scratch a line around it. Yeah, I just penciled this in. You won't be able to see the scratch marks on the video too well, but um, I can see them on the drill press. But anyway, so that gives me marks where I have to drill. So over to the drill press. Okay, so if you look at this blank, fairly thin on this side, fairly thick on this side, roughs on surface on there, can't get a faceplate to balance. This is one way to level up the top so you can get a good firm seat with your faceplate. Um, line this up over the center point. Doesn't make any difference if it's plus or minus a little bit. And I will drill down to about this depth on the shallow side and then I will drill the rest of the holes around it so I have a nice flat spot for putting the faceplate. <laughs> That should be flat enough. The thing with the depth stop is it gives you, you're going to get the same depth every single time. You can eyeball it if you're in a hurry. So now basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to nibble out all the way around this so I have a flat spot the size of my faceplate. So a series of holes drilled all the way around. I drill the first one here. That is my center point, so that helps me center up the face plate. Okay, so that's my center hole. Line that up as close as I can with the middle of the face plate. And then it's time to drive screws. Um, people differ a lot on what type of screws they use. I always have some of these decking screws along here. They're inch and a quarter by eight. Uh, you can use heavier screws. Some people use lag bolts. It depends on the size of holes that you have in your face plate. Um, you do not want to use sheetrock screws. Uh, primary thing with sheetrock screws is they're brittle. You can't actually break them as you're drilling in or if you're turning and you have a big nasty catch, they can snap and then you have to extract them, which is not a fun or pleasant chore. And also the thing here when putting your screws in, do it kind of the same way you do the lug nuts on your car wheels that are changing tires. Do one, do the one opposite, then this one, then this one, and work your way around. Don't start one side and go all the way around. It just balances out better. And another thing too with your drill, don't set the torque as high as it will possibly go. Uh, primary reason is you can actually snap the screws off even if they're good solid screws. So I'll usually set it for this one about three or about halfway up. So one screw.
another screw. Just kind of going back and forth and tightening from the side. Tightening from alternating corners. You know, especially if I'm doing green wood, I'll go around and tighten them all one more time. Make sure they're all down. And that's ready for mounting. If you're using a piece of really hard dry wood, it may be necessary to actually pre-drill the holes. Um, and sometimes you may actually want to put some wax on the screws. It just helps them penetrate a little bit better. Okay, a screw chuck is another common method for mounting. It's not one that I use. Uh, primary reason, first few times I tried it, I did not have a good flat surface on the top. And it was rocking, it was not staying stable, and I said that doesn't work, and I ended up switching to face plates before I discovered drilling a recess with a big Forstner bit. Um, it definitely has to have a flat surface for this to sit on all the way along. If there's any gaps under it and it can start rocking while it's turning, it makes a mess. And again, you can use your Forstner bit to make a big flat spot. Um, I have actually used the Forstner bit to make flat spots on natural edge bowls as well, just to make mounting a faceplate easy. So in the old days, before there were all the nice chucks that we have available to us nowadays, a very common way would be to use a glue block on a piece of wood like this. Um, and then you would attach a face plate to that. And this was made so you'd mount on the headstock. You'd turn the outside this way, turn the inside because it's still going to be up against the headstock, and then you would part the block off. Gluing methods on this vary. Um, I prefer the wood glue if I'm going to use it, like your standard yellow glues. You can take a piece of like brown craft paper, like your uh, grocery bags, put it in between the two layers, glue it, press it. Some people will use your CA glues, your hot stuff or instant glues. Um, they do have a little more gap filling abilities than your, like your yellow glues. Uh, I don't really trust them. They do work. I would make sure that I let them sit overnight. And then I would also run a bead all the way around just as kind of an added extra security thing. And some people actually do use hot melt glue. I would not trust it with the extreme stresses that I put on my bowls while I'm turning because I like to turn at a high rate of speed. Okay, so if you're going to be using a waste block, gluing it to your blank, you do not want to use plywood. Um, this is from many years ago when I was first starting. And the reason you don't use plywood is because when you're turning, it can do that. It doesn't have the structural integrity that most other woods do. So get something cheap, pine, fir, alder, poplar, or something like that. They work a lot better than plywood.